the throne. It speaks to us of great empires, lost kings and kingdoms. They present enduring images of grandeur, bloody conflict, heroism, and villainy. But they crumble like our physical selves, and in time are like the windswept feet of Ozymandias, buried in the dust of their empire. Mysteries. Today, we explore a timeless seat of power shrouded by nature and linked to one of the greatest struggles of the world and one of its greatest villains and their enduring mystery. The Abandoned Mansion's Nazi Secret Mission Mystery Having vowed to return to Scotland after exploring here in 2017, we have spent the time since finding a number of intriguing sites to bring you. The mansion you see now is one we are very excited to share. Hulking within its surroundings, it is almost obscured by the overgrowth and vines. You would not know from its state just how important a building it is or how closely it is tied to a major moment in British history. The lands surrounding us were once owned by Clan Buchanan. However, in 1682, John Buchanan, the last historic chief of the clan, passed away with no heirs. Due to outstanding debts, Clan Graham came to control these lands. The family seat at the time, called Buchanan Old House, was renovated in 1790 by James Graham, 3rd Duke of Montrose and head of the Graham clan. James Graham was responsible for the repeal in 1782 of the Dress Act of 1746, which prohibited the wearing of tartans and kilts, and was a famous speaker on Scottish topics in the government. Under his son, the 4th Duke of Montrose, the renovated house was however destroyed by fire in 1852. Famous architect William Byrne was commissioned by the Duke to build a large and ornate Renaissance baronial mansion, which he finished in 1858. The final building had one large square frontal tower, smaller towers and bartizans on most corners of the house, and two interior courtyards. The fourth Duke lived there and was known for playing cricket and being postmaster general for Britain. The family would eventually sell the house in 1925 when it became a hotel and golf course. By World War II, it was taken over by the government as a military hospital, and it was during this time that a strange and shocking event occurred there involving one Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess first rose to importance as a member of the NSDAP. He helped Hitler in the failed Beer Hall Putsch. While in Landsberg prison for the attempted coup, he was to help Hitler transcribe and write Mein Kampf. In 1933, he was made deputy Führer, and in 1939, he was named second in line behind Goering as successor to Hitler. He was responsible for the Nuremberg Laws, which stripped Jews of their rights, and was often used as a chief negotiator. As the war broke out, he became sidelined as he was not directly involved in the conflict in his position. He decided that with Hitler planning to attack Russia, he had to try to gain peace with the UK to avoid disaster. His friend Albert Haushofer advised him that the Duke of Hamilton was the leader of a group of anti-war politicians. He wrote to Hamilton, and on May 10, 1941, Hess flew in his plane equipped with extra fuel tanks, flying low to avoid radar and sight across the sea to Scotland in a daring attempt to reach the Duke and broker a peace between Germany and Britain. With him, he carried supplies and reportedly drafted peace plans. However, Hess ran out of fuel just 30 miles from the Duke's mansion of Dungavel and crash-landed his plane, but parachuted out in time. On landing, he broke his ankle and he was found by a local farmhand and arrested by the military However, his identity was still secret. Meanwhile, in Germany, Hitler received a letter from Hess explaining the mission and flew into a rage. Hess's allies were arrested and sent to camps. Astrologers, who Hitler claimed were the source of Hess's derangement, were also rounded up. Hess's office was annulled, his titles removed, and he was ordered to be shot on sight. That same day, Hess was brought to the Duke of Hamilton after repeated demands to meet him. However, unknown to him, the letters he had sent the Duke had been intercepted by MI5 and then handed to the Duke afterwards. Hess then revealed who he was and his mission and was sent to the mansion hospital we explore today to recover. The following day, the story was splashed across newspapers and Hitler was on damage control. 
Churchill listened to the peace plan offer relayed by the Duke and immediately dismissed it as an unauthorized mission of lunatic benevolence. After some time, Hess was taken to the Tower of London and held at various sites until 1945. From there on, with the end of the war, the mansion was used as an army school of education. But by 1954, the government removed the roof and demolished some side wings to avoid paying taxes, and the mansion fell slowly into today's decay. Joining us today in the journey is fellow explorer and YouTuber Discover with Pajerico, and our videographer and teammate Thinkmaker. We head into the trees with Pajerico, who has found a way into the giant building. A fragment of wall pokes out in the distance. My mission each exploration is to bring you the small details and strange sights that a video might miss, but photography can capture. It's one of the things we have in common that has kept me watching Pajerico over the years. His attention to minor details and the items that many miss and his focus on site history. If you enjoy abandoned sites in Scotland, he's a must watch and have added a link at the end of this video to his channel so you can check it out. Up ahead we encounter the first sign of the building where a fireplace is still attached to the wall of what must have been a remnant outer service wing. Through a window can be glimpsed tall walls covered in foliage. Places like this become their own enclosed ecosystems, home to birds, owls, and endangered bats, alive in the day and the night. It's clear we're reaching the main section of the building, which was spared the demolition of the 1950s. The gnarled vines and branches here add a distinctly sinister and strange element to the building. Shattered beams stab the ground like thrown javelins of giant beings living in this house of huge walls.
Far above, small platforms hang, formed by lonely fireplaces. I point out the near collapse of an arch, its keystone pushed down on and cracked in half by a wall of rock all soon to fall. It's good to keep an eye on what is around you, especially above and below. The rooms are verdant with plant life growing in every possible space. What makes a ruin, a derelict house, or an abandoned space? A general rule of thumb is that a house with no roof is a ruin, while one with a roof is less decayed and thus derelict. Many urban explorers now prefer buildings which still have electricity or seem abandoned just yesterday, and are often very clean. I find these to be too sterile for my taste, though still within the realm of the abandoned. There's a certain enthralling character to a place seized by nature with no sign of humanity's presence. A stair abuts a room with a singular bent tree and leads into unknown spaces. This distinctive fireplace retains some pieces of rusted grate.
These are the kinds of hallways where you always wonder what is at the other end. The gaping hole keeps us away, but we still linger. I always kick myself for not finding out, but I'm reminded that I've lived to see another location. Giant windows would have flooded the space with light before the trees snuffed out the view. Perhaps this was a sort of event space during its hotel days, or a meeting space. The slow structural collapse of the vaulted ceilings has dumped rubble in front of the fireplace and created a beam of light from above. It is always important to be spatially aware of these types of buildings. Is this a strange half-circular well?
Oddly, it seems to lead into the basements. Perhaps it had a metal grill and was related to drainage. Yeah, be careful. I kind of shimmied over to the side. The collapsed floor below leads to a number of dark entrances. This would have been one of the two courtyards with one side of barred windows and another side of huge interior windows, now entwined with vines. Ahead, the irresistible draw of a tall tower stairway. The steps are covered in plaster and almost obscured to the extent of being a steep ramp. Up and up until the giant steel beams that supported the mostly collapsed brick floors are revealed, still somehow intact.
Looking down from the top, it's clear one misstep, and one could roll down the stairs and out a now open window on the side, if just unlucky enough. As with anything exploring, moving slow is the way to go. It must have been a little harrowing to use these steps when they were new. Now they are far worse. Finally, back out in the courtyard, we wrap up today's exploration. In part two, we are excited to bring you the rest of the sprawling mansion, from its cellars, to its amazing main tower, to the last days of Hess and the enduring mysteries swirling around him. Until then. Subscribe and explore with us today.